Dwarfing even several apex monsters, Najarala makes for an imposing target for any rival. Typically found in temperate woodlands, its subspecies can reach even as far as polar regions. But above all else, its serpentine physiology makes it one of the most unique creatures in the series, and one ripe for exploration. One question that's been posed to me in the past is what Najarala eats, and similarly, why it's so low ranking for such a massive monster. And Najarala certainly is huge, with a length exceeding that of many elders too. But a closer look at its morphology may suggest it isn't actually built for large game. A look at Najrala's head in relation to the rest of its body shows a small head and a pronounced snout, both of which will greatly limit gape size. So whilst Najrala may be a potent predator, it may well struggle with the prey handling afterwards with actually eating it. To look at the snake best built for big game, we can see a pretty clear difference. Gaboon vipers have large heads for their body size and triangular ones too, allowing them a large gape for large prey. In fact, Gaboon Vipers have the widest heads for their body length of any snake, as well as the largest venom loads and fangs too. They also use these large robust fangs to help walk the jaws over their huge meals as well, and accordingly take the largest prey relative to their own body size of any snake, being recorded to kill and consume prey 104% of their own mass and swallow it whole. Despite constrictors being famous for it, the Bittis genus of vipers are arguably even more specialised big game snakes, with the adults preferentially hanging around game trails in the hope of grabbing antelope like diker, or other similar sized mammals like cane rats or genets. So no matter which way you slice it, Najarala just doesn't seem well equipped to handle large prey relative to its own body mass. There could be some potential ways around this though for certain prey, and some extant snakes have developed ways to bite off more than they can chew. Snakes that often eat crabs will throw coils around the body of the crab to function as something of a limb, and then pull the limbs off to be swallowed, allowing them to at least partially eat large prey too big for them to swallow whole. But there are caveats to this. It's worth noting that they only succeed in this with freshly malted crabs. But for the huge snake wyvern, this could still be one way for Najarala to potentially benefit from larger prey, and broaden its prey range to include carapacions like Damio Hermitor, and Neopterons or Temneserons like Nursilla or Celtus. And there is some precedent here. The two share the types of habitat like the primal forest to an extent, albeit with Najarala tolerating cooler and drier regions into the forest and hills. Its occasional burrowing behaviour may also suggest it preferentially searches for such animals too, as many giant monster hunter invertebrates will often rest underground. Najarala may not be a bug or crab specialist per se, but with its environment and sympatric animals, invertebrates may make up a fair chunk of its diet. For smaller ones like Celtus, it may also be able to pull apart most of the body, just leaving the horned thorax that may be too sharp or unwieldy to swallow. Though it may still struggle to apply this with large vertebrates, the jointed exoskeleton of even hardened crabs is likely easier to pull apart than the tough elastic tissues like skin and tendon. They typically require cutting edges. Plus, limbs are one thing and large torsos are quite another. So whilst this behaviour may help Najarala broaden its prey range, it may only take it so far. Outside of invertebrates, there's still a fair number of other animals with proportions Najarala should still be able to eat. It's likely not picky in the environs it inhabits, and will eat near enough anything it can grab that will fit into its mouth. As well as smaller monsters like Mosswine, Bullfango and Young Aptonoth, Bird wyverns like the raptors, Yankutku, and Malfestio are likely small enough to be taken too, presumably being struck from ambush as they themselves forage. Primates like the congas and Quechuacha are also potential prey, and even if the adult male Congalala is too large and rotund to be swallowed, Najarala itself is likely too big to be threatened by the defence of troop leaders. So even if Najarala isn't taking the massive game, some may have believed from its own large size, there's still plentiful other monsters it can potentially eat. It's worth a brief caveat on Delamador with all of this too, as many may wonder what a giant world serpent eats. Whilst Delamador's head is perhaps more traditionally snake-like, lacking the beak and tusks and resembling that of a giant Eurasian adder, 
It's also not heavily geared for consuming large prey relative to its own body size, which is also unsurprising as Delamador is the second largest organism known, and so nature only rarely does things that are large relative to its own body size. But of course, the chief one is Zora Magdaros, and as such, it's common to see the two depicted as battling in fan art. But with Zora's shell protecting it from constriction and most harm, as well as Delamador's likely inability to actually process Zora should it kill it, it's not very likely to succeed here. It's worth briefly talking about Zora here though, to suggest that they may still make up a fair chunk of Delamador's diet. Whilst Zora are naturally massive, the one followed making the Elder Crossing was a very large individual, around a quarter larger than average, making it the largest living thing recorded so far in the known world of Monster Hunter and almost certainly the oldest too, so it's not really an average individual. Baby Zora don't move from where they're hatched or deposited for considerable periods of time, and live underground or underwater for prolonged periods too, so it could be possible the juveniles look very different to the adults. Zora's shell is also made up of secreted waste products that grow as it ages, with it being held in place by the limbs that are usually wings in other elders. So while Delamador likely falls short against the Fifth Fleet individual, it may well still predate youngsters. If it finds sub-adult individuals, it may well be able to use the snake tactic of the loop and pull to pull limbs from their shells. Zora are actually comparatively slender body to an out of the shells, and so younger ones could potentially be swallowed whole. And Delamador does seem to have some precedent in tackling armoured prey. The odd joint on its teeth seems to be, in smaller snakes, an adaptation to eat armoured prey, a genus of skinks in particular. It allows them to be swallowed whole without damaging the teeth, but also while preventing the prey escaping. Considering most things Delamador would likely be eating, like Juvenile Zora, Leo Shenlung, and the Morans are armoured, it makes sense it would have this adaptation too to handle such tough prey. It's hard to make conclusions on truly giant monsters, due to their size, and the fact we can only speculate about aspects of how the largest terrestrial animals, the sauropods, lived on our world, but it's believed truly mature adults were rare on the landscape, with most of the population being made of younger animals. This is likely the case too with monster hunters giants, and full-sized individuals alive on the planet at one time, may be counted in the tens, if that, with the bulk of the population being far smaller immature animals moving up the conveyor belt. They are also likely are selected, and have huge numbers of small young they don't really care for with pretty high mortality. There may be limits to being this big too, even in Monster Hunter. In the Rotten Vale, we see skeletons of several Delamador-like animals forming much of the structure of the Vale. These are even larger than Delamador, and are believed to be an ancestor that died considerable time ago. It's unknown what brings Delamador together, but presumably fighting or mating are the main candidates, and at huge sizes where crushing each other is likely, these actions could regularly become fatal. If fatal on a regular enough basis, it would begin to trend for Delamador to get smaller. In life, there is something of a tendency to get larger, and different environmental or climactic conditions could have facilitated such growth. But it seems there is such a thing as too big even in Monster Hunter, and Delamador as a species ultimately began to select for smaller individuals to become the more reasonable sized specimens we see in For You. Diet-wise, Tidal Najirala may be similar to both the other snakes in Monster Hunter, in its unlikelihood of taking big game and a possible preference for hard-skinned prey. Tidal, as its name suggests, seems associated with polar coastal regions, and water in general too, and may well do much of its foraging in the sea. If it's anything like a sea snake, it could be aptly named as well. Greater sea snakes will increase their foraging efforts in receding tides, to try and find their catfish prey. The reasons are believed to be a combination of lower water levels generally favouring the snake, but also for chemical detection. Sea snakes seem to hunt by using vision to find likely prey spots, and then chemical cues to find the prey inside them. The water being drawn out of the hiding places and crevasses likely tell the snakes which spots are occupied by prey, and which aren't, allowing them to decide to search inside for a meal. So if tidal Najirala is similar, we can fancifully speculate that it may have even been named in-universe for the habit of hunting in the tides. 
If in more open water, tidal may be something of a benthic forager. Several species of sea snake are, and species of garter snake, which also regularly hunt in aquatic zones. The biggest snakes forage near exclusively on the bottom and chiefly for crayfish too, becoming more specialised than their smaller counterparts. Sea snakes in general tend to be more specialised than their land-loving relatives as well, and snakes more adapted for water also tend to prefer deeper water, and submerging themselves to hunt along the bottom too. So if tidal is anything like this, it does seem it'll chiefly forage in the lowest stratum of the sea. Slow-moving, benthic prey like assorted crustaceans could be its chief food source, especially as tidal nagerala likely isn't any better at consuming large prey than its more terrestrial cousin. Polar waters can still have rich prey bases of invertebrates like bivalves and crustaceans, and in the world of Monster Hunter they're also probably huge, so it may be possible for there to be sufficient food in the polar seabeds for the giant serpent. Like its cousin nagerala, it may not be too picky, and will still probably hunt anything it can get into its mouth. We know comparatively very little on the cold water seas of the monster hunter world, but there could be pinnipeds and cetaceans for them to try for, as well as the penguin-like species such as the duffelbirds. If on land, or if tidal is just a fun name over suggesting where it may live, it can still go for small prey like blangos, young popo and anteca, as well as bird wyverns like gyadrome and great baggy to sustain itself. Tidal Najarala may well be an active forager, and it may not have much choice in the matter. Few monster hunter beasts seem built for the cold, but are likely huge enough that they can withstand fairly low temperatures, without needing much overt insulation. But most of them also move mainly on land. If Tidal Najarala swims for a lot of the day, it'll be losing heat much more and even with its movement in deep snow, it's likely that much more of the body is in contact with the snow itself, and getting wet over just the limbs. As a very long animal too, Tidal has a large surface area with little insulation. Even though it's the length of a whale or more, it's still nowhere near as thick as them. It's unknown what Najarala's body temperature situation is either whether despite resembling a snake, it's an endothermic animal with metabolic control over its body, or if it is more like a giant snake indeed and is a large ectotherm. With giant animals, and especially reptiles too, there's always the chance of it being somewhere in between. Leatherback turtles are one such example, and can forage in the waters of Canada and Europe despite the water being zero degrees. They achieve this through both behaviour and physiology, and adults will spend as much time as they can at the surface where the water is considerably warmer, and they can get some solar radiation. Smaller individuals especially will also adopt a burn-it-to-earn-it policy, and increase their activity levels, with greater numbers of flipper strokes as they swim so muscle thermogenesis can keep them warm. In a similar vein, laminids, sharks, and tuna will keep themselves warm transferring the heat from the red muscle to the internal organs, saving the need to generate more heat not already made by swimming. But leatherbacks and others can still generate heat from metabolic processes too, and larger leatherbacks will often rely on such processes to keep themselves warm in subarctic waters, and to help digestion too. The jellyfish they eat, as well as the water they swim in, will cool down the internal organs when swallowed in large numbers, and so leatherbacks expend energy warming their insides back up after doing so. So again, if tidal Najarala is a coastal forager, it may well be leading a very active lifestyle in the water, swimming large distances and burning a lot of energy to both keep itself warm, and to bring whatever prey it's consuming out there up to temperature internally too. Perhaps Najarala's signature feature in either of them is the loose, brittle scales that make up its signature rattle, and can be launched at enemies too. This is obviously quite similar to a rattlesnake, and may have similar origins. When partially coiled in a defensive position, Najarala holds its tail out in front of itself, and when roaring at the player will rattle the tail being held adjacent to the head. The rattle aspect likely came from an old behaviour, and in snakes as well as the rattlers, the rest of the viperidae and much of the colubridae families of snakes will also vibrate the tail too when threatened. This can also be more prevalent in venomous snakes, and seems to be the warning before a strike much as it is in rattlesnakes. So it's believed the rattling initially derived from this defensive behaviour, 
possibly from the loose or shed skin initially too. So it may well have been the same in Najarala. What started as tail waving, possibly to distract a predator from the head, or make themselves seem better armed, eventually grew into the rattle paddles. When shedding skin, assuming Najarala do, loose skin hanging off the tail may have added to the intimidation with sound. That eventually became dead skin becoming the plates of the tail and the back of the neck. The fact Najrala can shed these for their attacks, and with little pain or blood, does seem to suggest the plates on all parts of the body are dead, cornified or keratinized tissue. The plates on the back of the neck appear somewhat reminiscent of a cobra's, but can't be expanded or retracted, as well as helping with the intimidation by rattling. These could also be to help prevent attacks on the head and neck, with them getting in the way of an attacker's jaws or claws. Going by the fact Najarala will also fling them as projectiles, the scales break into sharp edges that can cause bloody wounds on many potential attackers. Considering the way they stick in the ground too, broken Najarala scales likely stick in the opponent and cause lasting pain, as well as higher risk of infection too. Such defences are also seen in tarantulas with their urticating hairs, and the longest versions are especially designed for large vertebra predators. Even if not launched too, any predator that bites the plates likely receives severe lacerations to its mouth. And if that wasn't enough, Najarala is also poisonous. Should a predator get past its defences and succeed in taking it down, its bodily tissues are laden with paralysing neurotoxin, produced in the very bone marrow. Whilst Najarala adults likely face minimal predation due to both size and their effective armaments, a lot of these features may well still prevent any attack from more powerful monsters, but also be highly important in protecting juveniles. It's unknown how long it takes young Najrala to grow their plates, and how much parental care the adults may offer, but being toxic is always a good defence against getting eaten. If Najrala is immune to its own toxins, then cannibalism may well be the chief threat young Najrala typically face in their journey to adulthood. Overall, I'm fairly mixed to positive on Najarala as a whole. The idea is great, and a snake fight in a dinosaur and dragon fighting game is always welcome. But at the same time, Naja never really felt as standout as it should be. In some ways, I think For You was maybe the worst place to introduce it. As with such a big roster of memorable monsters, and the breadth of skeletons in that game, as well as just how diverse the early game hunts are, Naja never really felt as unique and memorable as it would have in other games. Even against some of the other low tiers, it doesn't quite feel like it stacks up. And maybe because Naja is quite a slow fight. It's a lot of either Naja being coiled up while you hit him, or it's slithering to new parts of the arena to then coil up again. I've seen some people really don't like Tidal Najrala with a saliva pinball thing. I'm personally of two minds about it. On one hand, nonsensical as it is, it's also quite innovative, and isn't damaging enough to be truly obnoxious, but on the other hand, it can still get pretty annoying. Normal Naja's incredibly long body, that can sometimes serve as a giant hitbox in small areas, is the greater pain if you ask me. Design-wise, Naja is fine. I can't help but feel it was given a lot of its extra features, as the team feared just a giant snake would look lazy. Yet that's essentially Delamador, and people liked it. There's also some mythological figures Naja could be based off too. I feel neither really need their limbs, and they maybe take away from the uniqueness. Unless they're needed as animation points, of course. I've also seen some say they want more snake wyverns, and as a group, they're always going to be quite limited. Naja already burrows, and there's no reason why it couldn't swim as well should water combat come back. Tidal is already somewhat claimed to be an aquatic animal after all. I think an environment-based deep forest snake could work well in a vertical map similar to the Coral Highlands. One you can base it off a flying snake, with the twist being it can only glide and descend rather than hovering or use upward flight, like many flying wyvern moves, and then having it strike from above and use the branches to gain verticality over the player. But overall, the snake skeleton just doesn't have quite as much you can really do with it when compared to others. Without just repeating Najarala, or being things that you may well just add to Naja or Tidal to keep them fresh and differentiated as fights. Snake wyverns are ultimately limited by what makes them unique. There's only so much you can do without any limbs. Thanks for watching, and thanks to top patron Venomenon for their ongoing generosity supporting the channel. 
thanks too to the Super is Duper, Amco the Terrible, Sonum Lobsong, K Sandum, Big Al, Erengar Steiny, Flygon's Archives, Hui Hui, Original Username, Tristan Berry, Evely, Howleth, Archazor Queen, Seth Fake Last Name, Zayse, Dodecamlos, and Bazugazu Bakohatsu Bakomatsu for their ongoing kindness keeping things going. A link is provided in the description for any who would like to sign up, and any amount is always appreciated. Thanks to Kamen Rider Moten for the digital artwork they provide for these videos too, and shots of Monster Anatomy. For more of their pieces, including ones not seen in these videos, be sure to follow them on their assorted social media, with links provided in the description. And thanks to I Am The Kaiju King for their excellent monster skulls for both Najarala and Delamador. For more skulls, more creatures, and more original pieces of artwork, be sure to follow them on their Tumblr. And if you can, support them on Patreon too, with links to both provided in the description. Thanks to all for the comments last week. I'm glad the crabs were enjoyed as some of the most requested monsters. Have different claws from the adult shoguns. The GBC-13 and a few others pointed out how the juvenile senators have different claws from the adult shoguns, and this does seem to support the idea of abbreviated development over direct, with the senators presumably having a significant molt phase to more resemble the adult shoguns. The reason may be ontogenetic niche partitioning, the smaller individuals eating different things to the adults so they reduce competition, and are less likely to be eaten themselves. No mention of the water jets, as I admit I just didn't have much to say here. Shoguns is also apparently canonically piss as well, so do with that what you will. Anyway, the roars for next time are 